Well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is the Russians didn't assassinate us after last week's episode. The bad news is this is episode 10 of Partners in Crime. This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Well, Bob, we're we're back in the spare bedroom again. Our, our brief sojourn in the dining room is over. Yes, yes, we have returned from the West Wing of Croft Mansions, <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, I, I like it here. It's oh, cozy. I do. I've, nice. I've become quite attached to it now. Um, we don't have a studio guest today, of course, but we uh, we will be speaking um, with the the wonderful Felix Francis, the the son of Dick yes. Francis, and the writer of his father's worldwide best-selling books. Yes, a fascinating man. I, we've uh, I've got to know him over the last few months, and uh, you know, it's uh, an extraordinary world, the Dick Francis world, mm. set as as most of you will probably know in the world of of international racing, um, uh, murder and skullduggery, and uh, um, uh, rife uh, in these books. Can't uh, beat a bit of skullduggery. You cannot, you know, you cannot. And uh, obviously, these this franchise has been going for well since the early sixties when uh, Dick Francis. Uh, began writing these uh, books with his wife and now his son Felix Francis uh, has taken over uh, over the last few years and has made a huge success of continuing uh, the uh, the legacy left to him by uh, his father uh, and mother. So we'll be talking to Felix uh, very shortly, a hugely entertaining man, so uh, stay tuned. Yeah, and uh, we were talking about last week's episode, my little quip about the Russians there. Uh, we, we had a poison special. We spoke to uh, we Dr. Dr John Emsley and Dr Catherine Harkup, and I've been reading her book, actually. Um, a is for Arsenic, The Poisons of Agatha Christie. It's absolutely fascinating. I'm completely gripped by it. It gets it gets quite heavy on the, the science sometimes, a bit heavy for me because I'm not scientifically minded anyway. But um, it's fascinating. I've been reading it um, fairly constantly since last week's episode when we, we spoke to Catherine, um, and I'm, I'm now on opium. Uh, you, 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 you look <laughs> fairly clear, clear-eyed to me. <laughs> By which I mean that's 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 the point at which I've got to. Um, o is for opium. I'm just having a quick flick through here because P is for phosphorus. That's what um, what comes up next. R is for ricin and S is for strychnine and, and so on. It's a hugely entertaining book, as we said last week. You know, yeah. especially you know, you you just say the science is is beyond you. Well, I mean, you know, I'm someone who's deeply challenged by the very sight of a, a Bunsen burner. <laughs> uh, but uh, both uh, uh, Catherine and, and John make uh, the subject so accessible in, do, yeah. in, in their books. So, uh, you know, as I said last week, their first class reads from a thriller point of view, mm. uh, uh, analysing Agatha Christie, or in John's case, analysing real life uh, uh, murderers, uh, poisonings. Um, I mean, so, who, Who's not interested in poisons? They're, they're pretty oh, yes. spectacular. And, and finding out that the kind of... The thing that struck me the most is how right Agatha Christie was about things you know the Catherine Harkup in in this book she kind of gets into some detail about some some plot holes and some sort of dubious character motivations and things that are in some of the books but pretty much every time she's spot on with the poisons yes oh Agatha she 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 knew what she was talking about you well know, she was, though, she was and it, it still applies now though, those truths that she Although, as as last week's program had pointed out, uh, thankfully, on the whole, poisoning is out of fashion. Oh yes, um, um, unless you're Russian. Unless you're Russian. Sadly. <laughs> right. um, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, by the way. So make sure you don't list, uh, make sure you don't miss an episode. Even it's completely free. Yeah, this, this podcast will never cost you a penny; it just costs us instead. Um, you can subscribe on YouTube or Stitcher or, or um, iTunes or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. Um, and if you want to get in touch with us to suggest a guest or a topic for a future program, you can email hello at partnersincrime dot online. We're on Facebook, facebook dot com forward slash partners in crime podcast and our twitter account is at crime fic podcast now before we get into today's guest interview as a listener to partners in crime you have uh, an exclusive 90 percent discount off of your first ebook at kobo there are more than five million titles available at kobo and you don't need an e-reader or a special device either you can listen on your, you can read even on your mobile phone or whatever it is you're listening to us on now just head to kobo.com select your book and enter the promo code crime at the checkout <laughs> Firstly, I should just say that we apologise for the sound quality during some of today's interview with Felix. The microphone Bob was using failed to record properly, but we've done some technical jiggery-pokery and tried to enhance it as much as possible. We hope it doesn't spoil your enjoyment of the interview. 
Our guest today is Felix Francis. He's a New York Times and Sunday Times best-selling author of racing thrillers. He is the younger son of legendary thriller writer Dick Francis, and since 2006 has taken over the writing of the Dick Francis franchise. Now, Felix's previous occupations included teaching advanced level physics in England, as well as being a deputy chairman of a worldwide expedition and leadership training company in London. Now, for a while in the 1990s, he also ran a real estate business in Houston, Texas. He is now a full-time writer, and he and his wife Debbie live in a 400-year-old manor house in rural England with their two Irish setters, who, he informs me, are the ones who are really in charge. I last saw him on Sunday at the Oxford Literary Festival, where he was in fine form, winning the festival just a minute and chatting uh, about thrillers. Hello, Felix. How are you? I'm very well, Bob. Nice to... to talk to you again well i know you're up against it today is the final day you've got to get your uh, draft of your latest novel uh finished today so we're not going to keep you any longer than we have to but we've been looking forward to talking to you so much and chatting about your wonderful books and also uh the legacy of of your father and indeed your mother so to begin with um does the word crisis mean anything to you at the moment <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm having a bit of a crisis writing this book, and, it, that, and that's what it's called. It's called Crisis. Um, uh, my latest, it'll be out in September uh, in the UK and, and um, October in America. And uh, um, the first line of it is, uh, my business card said that I was Harrison Foster, business consultant. But, uh, but in reality, I was my specialty was crisis management. And today's crisis involved a murder. Oh. So, yeah, but it, it feels like it's well named. There's a bit of a crisis going on trying to get it finished. Well, isn't that always the case? With I mean, uh, let's talk about your work process because I know that your 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 father. Uh, and we'll talk about how you um, began writing uh, uh, these books in, in, in a minute. But your father, obviously, uh, the legendary Dick Francis, had a very clear working pattern. I believe that he he would write his books between. Uh, I think January and May, deliver the first draft to publisher in May, take the summer off to, to relax and start percolating uh, thoughts on, on the next n novel, uh, and then uh, he'd go on to, to promote uh, the new book in, in the autumn and start all over again, producing one book a year. Do you follow the pattern of your father's timetable as regards well, producing the books? Pretty much, yes. The, the publishers, uh, in spite of modern technology, always seem to want the book earlier and earlier and earlier. Yes. So, so whereas my father sometimes didn't even deliver until the first week in June, uh, the publishers these days want it in, in March. So I, I, can't, I can't wait until January to start. Uh, and I actually um, get my nose down um, to the grindstone in September these days um and sometimes even in august and, and and i have to i spend june thinking through the story uh, trying to work out i mean i i've now written 13 and uh, as any writer knows the more books you write the more difficult it becomes to think up the story for the next one absolutely and uh, but it isn't just the 13 that i have to find a new book a different idea from but there's 39 dick francis novels as you yes. said the first one was published in 1962 and there was one every year for the rest of the century so are they all going to be different to that as well so it's getting more and more difficult but uh, especially as the publishers want me to keep uh, within keep racing in there somewhere you know keep within I mean, the well, con yes, the, the the racing world is very much the uh, the backdrop to to all the books. But I mean, you say it's a struggle. I mean, I've just finished reading Pulse, uh, which is uh, a, a fantastic read. So you're not making it uh, from the reader's point of view, or this reader anyway, look in any way difficult. Uh, which I guess is the art and craft of the novelist. Well, yes. Well, Pulse. Very often in, in the Dick Francis novels, mostly the the detective is a is. An amateur, you know, by accident almost, and in this, in the, as you say, in Pulse, which was the the last one that was out in hardback last September and will be out in paperback in June, uh, they uh, the, the, my main character is a doctor. Yes, and uh, in, in all the fifty-one 
uh, previous Dick Francis stories, we haven't used a doctor. Uh, uh, my father has, didn't and I didn't, partly because uh, it's a terrifying amount of research. Uh, <laughs> I have a, a newfound admiration for the amount that doctors know. Mm. Uh, and Cornelius Lysett, who's the BBC uh, racing correspondent, said to me at Cheltenham a couple of weeks ago at the Cheltenham Racing Festival, he said, uh, so if I have a medical problem now, I come to see you, do I? And I said, <laughs> uh, and I said to him, well... If you have super tachycardia, I'm your man. But if you've got anything else, forget it. And, and of course, <laughs> research. I mean, but but we, we put our, our our lives in the hands of doctors. So um, I decided to use a doctor. But it was, um, and I got great help from a number of, of different doctors. And it's a, the the main character is a racecourse doctor. Um, doctor Chris say, Rankin, I believe, isn't it? Yes, Doctor Chris yes, Rankin. Yeah, Chris Rankin. That's correct. Um, uh, and but. People say some people say I don't read your books because they're all about, about horses, but they're not. They're about people. Yes. Racing is racing is simply the canvas against which mm -hmm. I paint the story, and it's such a wonderful canvas because everyone goes racing from uh, royalty down to uh, you know the humble man in the street and the, and stable lads and you know it, it covers the whole socio-economic spectrum of of people um, and and hence. Uh, it is a wonderful background against which, and of course, there's lots of money um, sloshing around. I mean, yes. cash in gambling, and whenever, wherever there's money, there are always those who are trying to tweak the odds in their favour um, by all sorts of skullduggery. So um, it, it does provide a wonderful background for writing murder mysteries, I have to say. Well, and also an international scale, because, of course, horse racing is international. Uh, and uh, different rules apply, I guess, in the States and, and, and around the world to, to in the rules, UK. And let me tell you, different rules apply in, in each state. Wow. So there is no uh, set uh, rules and regulations for racing in, in North America. The East Coast and the West Coast have very different rules and regulations concerning what can and cannot be used in medication for a horse. So there's... Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, a, it's such a glamorous world. I mean, I can remember, I've been mean, talking back in the 60s now, when, when we got our very first colour television, uh, must have been 70s, and of course it was such an extraordinary novelty. And it was one of those old sets, Felix, that used to have to pull back the screen like a mini Odeon. And, uh, and I used to go to my grandparents before we actually got one. Uh, they had the first one in the family. And I used to sit and watch the racing uh, on a Saturday afternoon uh, with you know, the, the Queen Mother's colours being not, didn't need to be described anymore. You could see them. And I can remember sitting for hours just watching the racing in colour and thinking what a fantastic extraordinary world it was so uh, and I'll just point out at this moment that I wasn't born then I just uh, like to uh... he likes to get these things <laughs> yes well this is a mature, oh, Adam this, this, is a mature, this is a mature <laughs> the mature voice but um, talking about childhood I mean uh, you were I believe nine when your father uh, began his writing career his no writing career as a, as a novelist um, uh, after being a hugely successful jockey for many 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 years was that a big transition in the in the Francis uh, household? Well, I think it was uh, quite, but it, it was a fairly obvious transition in a way because Dad had, was already writing before that. Uh, he he'd been champion jockey the year I was born, uh, and he he rode for Peter Caslett, who trained for the Queen Mother, and hence my father was the Queen Mother's jockey, and and uh, he uh, famously or infamously rode Devon Lock in the nineteen oh, yes. fifty. Picks Grand National, um, which had covered uh, four and a half miles and collapsed just forty yards from the from the finishing line. Uh, my, my father always said it was the the noise of the crowd which frightened the horse, and uh, I believe him, having seen the film uh, uh, in slow motion, and see the horse prick his ears just before he comes towards the finish, and uh, suddenly you know the the wall of noise hits the horse and. And everything stops working for a second, and down he goes. And how my father didn't come off him, I don't know. Well, as a result of that episode, um, my father was invited to write some articles for the Sunday Express. Um, Sir John Juna um, oh, yeah. was uh, editor of the Sunday Express. And John was the first editor to use ex-sportsman 
Um, I mean, nowadays we think of all the um, journalists in newspapers as as ex sportsmen. You know, there's um, they're, they're all um, all the cricketers what played cricket and but in those days and broadcasters, aren't they now? Yes. Well, exactly. But in those days, you were either one of us or one of them. Mm. And, um, and John Junior was the first. He had um, he had. Um, Dennis Compton writing about cricket, Danny Blanchflower writing about football, and Dick Francis writing about racing. And he was the first what, first editor to use ex-sportsmen to write about their sports. And, uh, well, Dad had, had retired from riding a year after the Devonlock episode. He had a very bad fall at Newbury and ruptured his spleen and cracked his skull and um, broke his wrist and... And had to give up. I mean, Dad was really quite old to be a, a, a steeplechase jockey because he'd spent six years in the war in the RAF, flying Spitfires, Wellingtons and Lancasters when he should have been riding horses round Aintree. And he always said that the war um, deprived him of his best years. But nevertheless, it was this uh, Devonlock episode which got John Junior to ask him to write some articles. And he was a full-time... Uh, journalist by the time 1962 came along and my mother said well come on Dick you know uh, uh, writing for the paper is not as lucrative as being a jockey was being a top jockey and uh, we could do with a bit of added income um, <laughs> you all said you were going to write a story and now's the time and, uh, and that was it and, and Dead Search was published in January 1962 and uh, 39 books later, um, uh, they um, it was the year 2000, and that was uh, their last, really. Um, and she was and a it, major influence, your mother, on, on your father's work. In fact, they, oh, you know, very much a team. Oh, very much so. My father was always known, in, in the family, my father was always known as Richard. Oh, uh, that, right. That, that was because my mother's... Um, sister had also married a man called Dick. Um, and so my father was called Richard. My mother called him Richard. Uh, my uncle, who only died, sadly, a year ago, he called him uh, Richard. He was the last one, really, to call him Richard. But I always used to think that Dick Francis was Richard Francis and Mary Francis mm. um, together. You know, uh, I, uh, Siamese twins conjoined at the pencil, you might say. Um, <laughs> My father had uh, ideas poured out of him, and um, he he had wonderful um, ideas of, of of skullduggery and mystery and and mayhem on a racetrack. Uh, and my mother was a great believer in the uh, um, in the rhythm of sentence. She was a very much a, a wordsmith. She'd done a, had a degree in English, and uh, so the two of them combined uh, formed Dick Francis. And um, and that is how it went on. My, it was my mother's idea that uh, um, she thought that Dick Francis was a was a better marketing name than Dick and Mary Francis. So Dick Francis it became, and uh, they wrote them together. Well, and, I mean that's 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 absolutely fascinating. And and so the time uh, came when they decided to retire. Uh, after you know uh, producing such an extraordinary body uh, of work, um, well, I will tell you the funny thing is that um, they in 1999 um, uh, they they had decided that that they were going to retire. They were getting very tired. My father was by this time he was 79. My mother was in her 70s and and. Uh, and wasn't well. She hadn't been well for a very long time. Uh, she had polio when she was 26, and it left her with very difficulty breathing uh, for the rest of her life. So uh, the fact that she got into her 70s was remarkable. I, I, if anyone had told me that when I was a child, I'd have never believed it. Uh, so in 1999, they decided that they would uh, retire. And um, as usual, they went to the Royal Box at Ascot, um, uh, to deliver uh, the first copies of the book to um, their greatest fans, uh, the Queen and the Queen Mother in particular. Wow. And my father had said to the Queen, I, I took them there, I was there with them, and 
my father had always uh, said to the Queen Mother, with whom he had had a lifelong friendship as a result of the Devonlock episode, uh, he always used to say to her, Ma'am, uh, can I dedicate one of my books to you? And she'd always waved her finger at him and said, only when I'm 100. <laughs> uh, well, uh, in 1999, my parents took the book to the Royal Box at Ascot and handed over it, the book. And they, my father was about to say that this would be the last because they were retiring. When the Queen Mother said to them, I'm so looking forward to my book next year. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I can remember driving them home afterwards and my mother saying, oh, God, we've got to do it all again. <laughs> and, and they did. And they produced a book called Shattered, which I have to tell you was very well named because they were shattered. When I went out and collected it, and my parents lived in the West Indies because of my mother's health. It was not good in this country in the winter in particular. And uh, <clears throat> I went out to collect the book with just one week left to uh, the deadline, and, and it was only two-thirds written. So uh, there was a lot of panic going on, uh, and, and my parents were very distressed by the fact that they were really struggling to get this book finished. So I rolled up my sleeves and sat down at the, at the dining room table and spent the week, day and night, writing the, the last third of the book, what, so that uh, was the moment that your that, writing career began, well, that was it? was the moment. I'd written bits of Dick Francis novels for years. I mean, I, I the first bit I wrote was uh, I designed the bomb that blew up uh, an aeroplane in uh, Rat Race when I was a A-level physics student uh, uh, at <laughs> 17. So I, it was, a, my mother always used to say uh, it was the family business. Mm. Anyway, the... Uh, uh, Shattered was eventually um, finished and sent into the publisher. And that um, year, we went to the uh, Royal Box again to give the Queen Mother her, her, a copy of her book dedicated to her. And I'm very pleased to say that it was two days before her, two or three days before her 100th birthday. And uh, she signed a copy of, uh, of the book for me. And uh, I, that's one of my very treasured possessions. Well, I mean, that's a, what an extraordinary story. I mean, I, I I can't think of any any writers that would actually have that particular story. But oh, this idea that it was all hands to the pump with the, with with the Francis family is extraordinary. Let me just tell you though, Bob, it was unfortunately the book was called Shattered, and it was very well named because it it did uh, shatter them, and uh, they announced their retirement in September um, at the beginning of September when the book was published. And my mother died on the last day of September oh. from heart attack. So it was a book too far. Um, How very sad. Uh, yeah. And it was sad. Um, uh, but um, I suppose that uh, she wouldn't have taken kindly to retirement anyway. So now looking back 18 years later, I can say that she went out at the top. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, well, a, a sad and poignant story, and, and but also an, ex an extraordinary story. Uh, so what happened then? Because, uh, uh, you know, your father was in retirement after that book, I guess. So there were no Dick Francis novels being produced for a, a period of time. No, well, with the death of my mother, my yeah. father was now 80, and... Uh... Everyone thought that that was that. There would be no more Dick Francis novels uh, because, you know, there the just wouldn't be. Anyway. These, these are books. Sorry, Francis. These are books which are read worldwide. I mean, you've got a huge following in the States, for instance, and, and whatever. So, I mean, there's a, there's a huge number of, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of readers, maybe more worldwide, who each year were waiting for the new Dick Francis, and suddenly it wasn't coming. Yeah, suddenly it wasn't coming, and, and and five years later, when there hadn't been a new Dick Francis for five years, my father's literary agent asked me to lunch. Well, that wasn't unusual. I was managing my father's affairs by this stage, and uh, so I went to have lunch with him, and the agent said, well, we've got a problem, and that is that all the books are going out of print. Uh, 39 wonderful books, wonderful stories. It's not that they're not good enough. It's just that everyone is forgetting about uh, Dick Francis and the books will um, are going to go out of print. Uh, and 
you know, I mean, I used to uh, lie awake at night under the bedclothes with a torch reading Alistair MacLean and Desmond <laughs> yeah. Hattie, Hammond Innes and all of those sort of things. And they've all, all gone out of print as well. And, and some magnificent stories uh, simply um, have gone out of print. I mean, there are a thousand books published in this country every week. I'll say that again. There are a thousand books published in this country every week. That's 50,000 books a year. But the bookshops haven't got room for the new ones, let alone all the old ones. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the books were going out of print. Everyone was forgetting. And um, that was a problem as far as I was concerned, because I know I thought they would provide my father with a pension for the rest of his life. And with a bit of luck, they'd provide me with one, too. But that wasn't <laughs> going to happen. Uh, so the agent said to me, what we need is a new hardback. Well, I looked at him as if he was completely barking mad because <laughs> you know, I said to him, well, you know, my mother died five years ago. My father is now 85. And God bless him, he can hardly remember what he had for breakfast, yet alone enough to write a book. Because <clears throat> as you know, Bob, from your writing, you have to, you know, you need a good memory. Uh, yes, you do. And uh, so... The agent said, no, I'm asking your permission if I could ask an existing crime writer, successful crime writer, uh, if he would write a book, uh, a Dick Francis novel by so-and-so. I won't tell you who it was because he's still alive. <laughs> um, and, and he was never asked because I'd had a few glasses of red wine by that stage. And I said to the agent, I said, well, Andrew, before you ask anyone else, I would like to have a go. And he didn't bat an eyelid. He didn't raise his eyebrows and say, don't be ridiculous. Um, why do you think someone with no writing experience could write a book worthy of the name Dick Francis? He didn't say any of those things. Um, I mean, I, he knew I'd, I'd written pretty much the last third of Shatters, so he knew I could put a few words together. And he simply said, "You, I'll give you two months to write two chapters. Well, I went home to my wife and said to Debbie that I think I'd done something a bit silly. And she said, don't be daft. Come on, we'll, I'll, you know, I'll encourage you. So off I sat down um, and uh, wrote the two chapters and sent them in. And I think Andrew probably thought that after I'd spent two months trying, he would then get my permission to ask who he wanted. <laughs> uh, I see. But he read the two chapters and he said, well, there's two things you've got to do. One is you've got to get on and finish it. And secondly, you've got to go and talk to your father. Oh, of course, yes. Uh, which was a lot more difficult than finishing it. And uh, uh, my father wasn't keen on the idea at all. He said, no. He said, I'm retired. No, no, no. And he anyway, wasn't keen on you actually writing, taking over the... the, the... Well, I, I think he just thought that it was, um, you know, time to stop. You right. know, my mother wasn't there anymore. And perhaps it, he felt that it was just time to stop. Anyway... I eventually convinced him to read my two chapters, and he suddenly got quite excited by it. And I got on and finished the book, and the book came out in 2006 called Under Orders, and it was um, just had Dick Francis on the cover. It didn't have my name on it at all. Oh, I see. Which was my idea. I mean, yes. if it was to stimulate the backlist, it had to be a Dick Francis book. Mm. Um, uh, I might say that that, you know, Two years later, all the backlists were republished, rejacketed, and republished by the publisher. So it, it did work. Uh, but the book, of course, sold very well. It went to number two in London, number three in New York. It was even number one on the on the Los Angeles Times. Uh, I knew it would sell because it had the Dick Francis name on it. Yes. And all the previous fans just you know flocked out and bought it. But I was slightly worried, well, more than slightly worried, um, about the reviews. I mean, I'd had a number of people, you know, my father's ex-editor and ex-publisher had read it before, you know, in order to make sure that it was, well, I called it the Dick Francis Police, to make sure that it was worthy of the name and wasn't going to do any damage. Uh, but the reviewers, I thought, would say, oh, you know, Dick's lost it. But they didn't. They didn't. They all said, "Oh, the master is back," and the publishers said, "We want another one." And I started writing "Dead Heat," and that came out with Dick Francis in enormous letters on the cover, but underneath it, in the smallest font they could find, and Felix <laughs> Francis. 
<laughs> and gradually, but it was, and it made me laugh that some of the reviewers said, well, I can see which bits Dick wrote and which bits Felix wrote, which made oh, us did. all laugh. Oh, yes. Clever made Dicks. Us all laugh because I wrote all of it. Yes. And, uh, and over the years, my name's got bigger and his has got smaller. Well, and you're, you're certainly a, a big font on the front of the book I've got in my hand at the moment, uh, and, and, and deservedly so. I mean, but your parents must have, you know, be, be, your father must have been very proud of the fact that you'd actually, you know, picked up that particular gauntlet thrown, uh, that challenge. Uh, and... So, yes, I mean, in the end, he, he I mean, he, he, he was, he, he told everyone um, uh, that he was very proud of them. And, 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 my, and the agent said, well, you know, you've given your father something which most people don't get, which is immortality. And I said, well, I may not, it may not be immortality, but I've kept the name alive for a little bit longer than it otherwise would. I mean, here we are in 2018, and I'm, I have a, a, an idea that uh, two years from now, you know, all being well and me still writing them, that that will be the centenary of my father's birth. And uh, perhaps we'll do something to... Um, fly the Dick Francis flag then as well. Which well, that would be marvellous. I mean, it really would. Well, can you tell us about uh, Crisis? Because it's, it's coming out this September, I believe. Uh, yes. And what's, what's, what's your story on that? Because, of course, you don't yeah. come back to a... You don't return to a, 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 a detective or a regular character. It's not a series of books. Virtually all the books, with, uh, with two or three uh, uh, exceptions have completely different heroes, uh, protagonists in, in the leading roles, he says, uh, wearing his actor's hat. Um, so each each book is fresh, a new set of characters, uh, a new person in charge, uh, and always in the, in the first person. So what's Crisis uh, about? Well, well um, my wife says um, that uh, I need to be very careful what I write in the book because everything I write in the book seems to happen uh, straight after I write it. In reality, oh, right. and, and I went out to uh, to Corfu for um, at the beginning of June and wrote the first chapter of Crisis. I like to get the first level, well, probably half a chapter under my belt, which is just introduces the character and the story, and then I start thinking and researching it uh, through July and August, ready to start proper in September. So I'd written about a. Uh, uh, it's quite difficult to say this, really. I'd written about. Uh, I started off by deciding that there would be um, that horses. The the, the favourite for the Derby um, would be killed in a stable fire, uh, and then the police would discover that there was human remains in amongst the equine ones. Uh -huh. um, and having written that uh, bit. Or well, at least the description of the fire, we woke up to the fact that Grenfell Tower had burned down. Yes. And uh, and this happens time seems to happen to me time and again. Uh, I wrote about a three times winner of the Gold Cup, dropping down dead of a heart attack, uh, and then six months later, best mate, who was a three times winner of the Gold Cup, did exactly that. Um, I've written all about all sorts of things which then come true, so it's slightly disconcerting. So uh, my copy editor says, could I please not write about a copy editor who has a heart attack? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in fact, he then wrote, and said, uh, so I said to him, I said, uh, well, shall I write about a copy editor who wins the lottery? And he thought that was a very good idea. <laughs> but... but um, so uh, the premise of this book is that, uh, as I said, the favourite of the Derby is... Um, killed in a in a stable fire, uh, and uh, and then the police discover that there are human remains in there as well. And the question is, did the person who set the fire uh, die in it, or was uh, uh, was there something else around? And then, of course, the post mortem shows that the person found in the fire was actually dead before the fire started. So. Uh, anyway, That's, that, that, well, I'm, I'm hooked already. And it's all set in Newmarket. And I made my character someone who not only doesn't like horse racing, but he's frightened of horses. <laughs> uh, because I thought it would add a little... Oh, that's little, brilliant. Yes. ...line to it. Uh, not happy uh, in, the, in the, the world of racing and horses at all. 
No, he, he, no, he does, has knows nothing about horse racing uh, or anything, um, and uh, I mean he learns a bit. So this but, the crisis is going to be out in September. You're going to be finishing it today, so we're going to have to let you go and and uh, and uh, dot the i's and cross the t's, uh, yeah. uh, what, uh, the rest of the day. And, uh, and then I'm going to read it, read uh, read the ending, uh, make sure I got it all right because. Uh, it's tomorrow is my deadline, so um, I, I finish it today. Read through the last bit tomorrow, make my final adjustments, and then I will email it about one minute to midnight. <laughs> and then have a rest. That, for that, a that sounds very familiar. Uh, <laughs> what a lovely feeling it is, actually, just I, waving the novel I, goodbye. I, I think I'd have a rest, but oh, family are descending on us for Easter, so that'll uh, um, keep you busy. I don't think I'm going to get much chance of a rest this, this week. <laughs> well, Felix, as ever, it's just a delight talking to you. Thank you for letting us into the world of, of the Dick Francis novel, and then uh, as written now by, of course, uh, your good self. Uh, Crisis is out in September. Uh, and to everyone listening who, who have not read uh, a Dick Francis novel or a Felix Francis a novel uh, because they were put off by the fact it was uh, from the racing world don't be as Felix has just said it's about the people the characters they're great thrillers they're great plots so uh, go out and get your copies now you won't be disappointed in them oh thank you Bob I'll, uh, I'll, the, the check will be in the post thank you I'll, go, I'll add it to the other one um, <laughs> listen all the very best have a smashing Easter uh, from, from Adam and myself and I'll be seeing you very soon I know that Good. Look forward to it. Now, all of Felix's books are available on Kobo. Why not give them a go? Head over to Kobo.com, pick up a Felix Francis book and enter the promo code CRIME at the checkout and you'll get 90% off as a listener to Partners in Crime. Another great interview, Bob. Uh, yes, um, you know he's a fascinating uh, chap. I mean, we do uh, a few festivals uh, together, um, and we sit and just banter away, uh, really. And he's a fascinating chap, and uh, his uh, approach to uh, to writing is always very interesting. I mean, I love the way he says, "I, I start my novels in Corfu." And I happen to know he's just <laughs> got back from three weeks in the Maldives, uh, where he's been finishing. And I think, I think, yes, that's that's the sort of writer I'd like to be—the mm. one who actually can start. Start and finish his writers um, abroad and in the in the sunshine. A sort of writer who doesn't have children knocking around. Well, he's, and, he's got yeah. dogs, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, but you know these things are hard won. Uh, and uh, you know he's uh, he's fascinating on on writing. He's also very good at just a minute. He, he won the just a minute uh, at Oxford this. Uh, just a minute, Nicholas Parsons comes and does a special festival programme of the Radio 4 show, which is hugely successful. And uh, I was uh, on the panel uh, in Gibraltar for the Gibraltar Literary Festival uh, last year. Um, uh, and uh, th scared the hell out of me. How did you get on? Uh, I did all right, I think. Uh, well, people were very kind. Uh, <laughs> I managed to speak for a minute without sort of uh, interruption, repetition, or deviation. Well, considering listening to me now, stuttering away, you, you think I wouldn't, wasn't able to do it? But it was no, it was absolutely great fun. And uh, but he is very, very good at it. Uh, um, is Felix Francis, and usually ends up winning against some pretty stiff opposition. Uh, and competition uh, of which uh, I am not uh, a, a part of, I have to say. Um, but uh, good fun, um, yes. And he's, uh, he's. I think he's going to be. Uh... Well, hopefully he'll have his um, latest book finished soon as well. He, he should hopefully back. Well, at, I love the, the fact that we've caught now. him on the very last day. <laughs> you know, I think there's there's a sense of thriller about that. The, the thriller, you know, he's got to get the book away tomorrow. There is a deadline. There are yeah. there, are, um, um, or, or sort of his publishers are, are on the phone and emailing him and putting pressure on him. I mean, I think that's something that we all understand. I mean, I'm going through a bit of it now with with, with, with my latest book, and uh, there is a, a sort of pressure. It's not life and death. We write about life, life and death, uh, I, I guess, uh, but. But the actual uh, process of writing a book uh, is not, but it is can be quite stressful and it can be a lonely business. Well, the, the final days leading up to a deadline are often 
uh, the most fraught and it's a there are times when writers don't like to be distracted by uh, by things like podcasts speaking of which yes i'm on a bit of a deadline myself oh yeah yes <laughs> so um, pray do tell so i'm just uh, looking at my watch thinking um oh i've got some words i need to get out well you told me when i walked in today that you've done two and a half thousand words i had yeah i was at the, at the computer at half seven this morning Bashing a few Christ out. Um, well, I had, had no choice, unfortunately. It's, 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 it's your laptop. Getting... Yes, it's, it's it's red hot. It's, <laughs> it's starting to look a bit worn, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Well, I two and a half thousand words. I've, I've never been able to achieve that. Well, more needed. More needed. On on which note, um, if you have any suggestions for future guests on the show, we do uh, take yes, them all very do. seriously. We don't throw all of them in the bin. Um, email us hello at partnersincrime.online. We're on Facebook, uh, Partners in Crime Podcast, and on Twitter at Crime Fic Podcast. Um, I think that's about it. Yes, that's episode 10 in the can. Yes, and um, hopefully many more to come. Oh, yes. Unless the Russians are still trying to work out where we live. Oh. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Beish. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, Perfected. Perfected.